Coming to you live from downtown Detroit, this is Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep with your host, Joel Conan. This is a volatile puppy here, isn't it? And Dennis Dick. I've been the penny. I will buy the stock for a penny. With everything you need to start your trading day. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this Tuesday edition of Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep from Spencer Israel. As always, here with Joel Elkanen and Dennis Dick on this show today. Lots of news, some earnings, some not. Uh, a lot of movers yesterday that weren't earnings. We had the Disney uh, 21st Century Fox streamer. We've got the shippers continuing to rally. Uh, Priceline, TripAdvisor, AMC all reporting. Uh, VRX as well this morning. So we'll talk about all of those stocks. Of course, we'll take your questions from our live chat at premarket.benzinga.com. At 835, we are going to be joined by our options expert, Nick Shaheen, author of Create Income with Option Spreads. Joel, how's it going this morning in the market? Markets. I may need to reboot my computer. The S and P's are down a point and a quarter here at eighty-seven fifty, ninety-three fifty. The overnight high, but let's keep an eye on Monday's high. That was a regular session high at ninety. Even your all-time closing high, eighty-eight point seven five. We're below that, so a little resistance forming up ahead. We'll see if we can take it out. On the downside, not seeing anything to lead on until your interday low from yesterday at eighty-two seventy-five. Don't look now, but crude oil is over $57. This long-term trading range that we've been in, we're at the top of it and through the top of it here. So that could be giving a, a boost to oil stocks here. You can see 57.69 made a new high from yesterday, but now down on the session. Gold and silver both caught a crazy pop yesterday, uh, but Given a little bit back today, gold down by 380 at 1277.80. Silver still above 17 at 1706 and a half, but down 17 cents. All right, Dennis, early start here at 803. What are you seeing out there in the pre market trading? Seeing lots. And, you know, just you know, going back to the oil just for a second before we start jumping into the plethora of earnings reports here again, 178 stocks reporting today. A lot of oil is on breakout. We've been talking about this range from 45 to 55 forever, and that is a breakout from the last couple of days. Yesterday, huge day for oil, and I, I don't know, 55 is gone as resistance here now. So, what do you think? Like, go back to the charts here, and it's hard. You can't really use anything like the USO because that's got so much uh, deterioration just because of the way the product's structured. But what about the crude futures themselves? What do you see when you look over? And I know the rolls make it confusing as well, but. What do you see for resistance here coming up? In well, I should have bought what I should have done. I should have bought it when it broke above 55. And, I know. Uh, we both should have. <laughs> yeah. We talked about it. We talked about it on the show. Uh, um, but I'm going to reserve my comments. Nick is pretty good because he has been trading the range in this for quite some time, not exactly nailing the low or the high. But this time, you know, for some reason, he just didn't like that shorting it at that top of the $55 range. And we're not getting a lot of talk about it, but I think what's going on in Saudi Arabia, I mean, that I, that's just not good what's going on over there. I think that could have some implications for the oil market. All those arrests. Yeah, in the oil producing countries. I thought it might hit the market. I was wrong about that. But, um, you know, it's all about supply and demand. And, you know, if these companies or countries start ganging up on each other, I mean, there could just be like a blow off spike, too, because, you know, there's a lot of people that are caught short this thing. You know, it's in a trading range. But uh, I don't want to say anything. I want, I'm not going to say 60 bucks because that's quite a ways away. But 59.69, you got to go back to June of 2015. Uh, to get to that level, but 60 is definitely a psychological level. But let's see what happens on the daily charts. And you got two highs right now, one at 761 and 769. So right now, that's your short-term resistance. Jump over to the shippers. Ace is talking about in the chat. We just pre pre previewed them on our pre-market uh, prep video there for the pre-market show. And we've been talking about these. I've been talking about them for a couple of days, and I wish I would have got a chance to mention them yesterday, but we didn't. These are all interesting charts here. I mean, long term, these things are still dogs, dogs are dogs, but dogs bark. And when they bark, there is opportunities. And obviously, we're looking at, you know, these different shippers. You know, dry ships is the one everybody thinks of. But the one that really kickstarted this rally, Joel, and you were pointing this out to me, too, was Diana Container Ships, DCIX. And if you go out and look at that one, 
just out onto the dailies or even onto you know just the last few days. The stock you're saying had a reverse split just a few days ago, and it just blasted off. It went from five to fifteen or or eight actually it went from five to twenty. That would have been on Thursday. Pulled back to ten. These things are wild. Then it went up all the way up to 26 bucks and pulled back a little bit to 22. So you're talking about a stock that did a little reverse split and went from five to 25 here in two days. Talk about a 400 percent move. This DCIX, Dennis, and this is going back a long time. I don't know if we. I might have mentioned this before. I don't know if we have any old oldie traders here, but there used to be a stock listing on New York called Diana Shipping. And I think they were like, they just ship fish. And it well, was there a, still is DSX. Is that's that, a different stock. Oh, it is. Yeah, that's still stock? in existence too. Okay. All that right. had a blast off too. I don't know. Maybe people, I think it's two <laughs> different companies, but maybe it was like, well, one's going. You got DCIX going. So maybe Diana Container Ships, maybe Good Diana call. Shipping goes to, maybe they're related. I, I don't, I don't, I didn't think they were, but you know, DSX, if we just look at that one here, that's actually trading up here in the pre market too. Anything with shipping in it right now is trading higher. I mean, we're going to go through all these and, you know, DCIX is tops. There's GLBS, SHIP, ESEA, SINO. There's a pile of these things. They're eternal dogs. But once they, you know, get these little short squeezes going, these things have three, four, five hundred percent moves sometimes in a couple of days. And I really, I just, I don't really think I can give, I can give technicals on just about anything. But I think if you're trading these things, I think you got to go to a shorter term chart. And just, you know, trade the swings because, I mean, they're all been reverse split, right? At some point. A billion times. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just, I don't know where the value is in these companies. You see what happens to them. And there could be a lot of money made on the long side. I think, and I, I did look at this DCIX. And what happens is, is that you have this reverse split, right? So then it was a $2.10 stock. This is all adjusted, trade 194,500 shares. Just was on November 1st. And then the next day it goes to 250 on 10 times the volume. Uh, not quite, about eight times the volume. So then the machines get going, right? And the machines start picking this up. And then the next day it leaps eight bucks on 29 million shares. So it's just, you know, they're not holding this for a long-term investments. It's this machines just buying it, buying it, buying it, and putting out higher offers. It's getting taken. And uh, now you're getting to the situation here, the DCIX, where it had a big update yesterday, but the volume is starting to taper off. So usually these things don't come back down to earth until, you know, everyone is like in the pool and then the big guns stop trading it and there's no volume to get out. But uh, interesting. I mean, Dennis, I know you like to trade stuff with good risk reward ratios and it's just not here. This stuff is difficult to chase, um, but sometimes the setups are there. And I don't know if you're coming in here now. Now the risk is a lot higher than it used to be um, just a few days ago. But, you know, when one starts getting started, Oh, That's yeah. when you start thinking about the sympathy plays. And I do trade these every once in a while because they all tend to move together to a certain extent. Often dry ships is your leader. That has not been the case this time. DRYS was not the leader. It was this DCIX that kickstarted it. But now you're seeing this morning tops, t top ships, which is another one that was 50 cents here just a couple days ago, ran up to a buck and a half there on, I believe it was Friday. And then yesterday just blasted off into orbit. It goes from 75 cents up to a buck 75. Well, today it's going to 279 on 3.2 million shares. So this one is blasting off too. You got GLBS is another one of them. Um, Globus Maritime. And the stock is up this morning, 48%. Closed yesterday at $1.31. Now it's trading up at $1.95. I mean, when they get kick started, they go. So it's like, you know, just starting the engine. And then, like you said, I don't know if it's machines. It could be a little bit of machines. So it's just, you know, a lot of traders. Traders, that, yeah. You know, these are lower volume and that's all momentum traders that just come in. They're like, it's going. Let's hop on board. And it moves. So now, you know, now you look at it and this thing was 50 cents three, four days ago. Now it's a buck 95. Now the risk is a hell of a lot higher. So if you are trading any of this stuff, I would use tighter stops now. But if you're looking at them a couple of days ago, there's definitely opportunities. And when the when the leader starts to fade, there's also an opportunity on the other side as well. You know, if you're you know trading, it's you're always two sides to every trade. You can buy it long, you can go short as well. Not saying to do that at all, but I would keep an eye on DCIX because That's that was leader. the one that really kickstarted it all. And if it turns around and starts to crater, not saying it's going to do that. This is this is what trading is all about. It's setting up what if scenarios. So if it keeps going, 
maybe these other ones keep going. But if it starts to fade, the other ones could start fading too. So that's what you got to do as a trader is always be able to, you know, quickly turn when the momentum starts turning. And, you know, that's the key to trading this kind of stuff as well. You know, the stuff that I like trading, a little more conservative stuff, you know, I have my base head trader. This is home run stuff. So if you like trading this type of stuff, and sometimes I'll dabble into this type of stuff, you need to be very tight with your stops and you need to protect your capital at all costs. Because if you're not protecting your capital on this kind of stuff, you can lose 20, 30, 40% in a hurry. So that's the, the consideration there when you're trading these things is you got to be tight and you got to identify who the leader is of the day and going with that. And I'm going to say, you know, today you can say, oh, well, DCIX is only up 15%. So why is it the leader? Well, it was one of the kind of the one that kickstarted it all. Though. So, you know, Tops is up 66%. So it's more. Maybe you think it's the leader. You watch them all, though. But to a certain extent, I still think DCIX. I'd keep an eye on that one if I'm trading any of these other ones. Uh, I would keep an eye on that closing price, too, of DCIX if you want to you know, keep numbers. The closing price for each of these is important because a lot of people that did take them home, it goes red. It's marketed against them. And then also, I think if you're going into these things, half and whole numbers, you know, like here it hit 2848. I think that's, you know, you'll find orders just like a big stocks congregated at those levels. And as far as I know, there hasn't been a big increase in demand for uh, for shipping and stuff in containers. I don't know how. No, the, I, these price moves and Joel, I'm nothing. I would say <laughs> nothing to do with fundamentals of the company. You know, sometimes it's an article, sometimes it's kickstarted, but these things trade just on momentum, and they're you know, and they continue to you know go down in the long term. So you're coming to these things and saying I'm sticking these, and I'm gonna you know be happy. I bought these two years from now. I don't know about that. You know, I don't think these are long-term buys here. These are trading vehicles. I would trade them as trading vehicles. So, you know, keep an eye on them, but be very tight with the stops and don't let something get away from you. Because if you do, these things can get ugly in a hurry. Uh, dry ships was kicked off. We wrote an article about it a couple of weeks ago, right, Spencer? The guy did the Seeking Alpha or the Forbes, and then he was on the street.com. And that was in dry ships. And uh, I can't even do the long term chart here, but, uh, you, you know, like five bucks is a key level in that to hit it again in pre market trading. But let's talk about a real stock and let's talk about Priceline here. I'm sure people wow. are looking at the screen there and saying, holy cannoli, what kind of report did they have or guidance can, may have hit it? Uh, Priceline reported yesterday after the bell Q3 adjusted EPS of $35.22 versus a $34.25 estimate. So they beat the estimate by about a dollar for the uh, Q3 uh, EPS, but uh, I believe it was guidance that knocked it down. Let me look a little bit closer here. Um, yeah, there. Well, it, it was it's actually press on entry up this morning, but uh, their 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 total travel services booked in Q3 was actually up 18% year over year, which is a good number. But uh, it, it was it was the guidance that knocked it down. This is you know, and, and one thing to consider, I guess you got to put it in perspective. It was a $1,900 stock, so when you see a stock down 167 points, you say, "Holy cow! How is that possible?" Well, it was only 8.7%. <laughs> But it is a big down move here. And we are going to save a lot of our comments here from when Nick Shaheen comes yeah, on because we know he's the price line master and he's coming on in 20 minutes. This is his baby. He trades this with options all the time. We'll set up, he'll set up probably some strategies for us to trade this price line on this significant down move. I mean, you know, really, when you look at these things, every time it's pulled back 170 or 200 points, it's been a buying opportunity. But it's always hard to catch a falling knife. I think uh, John Dodson was saying that in the chat earlier. Um, you know, and that's something that a lot of traders do wrong. They jump in too early. You know, and you might have saw this, you know, last night after hours saying, oh, it's down 100 bucks, going to bounce back. Now it's down 170. So when you are jumping into these <laughs> things, I always like to wait for a bottom to form. And that's not going to happen, you know, in a few minutes. I'm talking about like on the daily charts, wait for a thing to, you know, give you a chance. Like look at Celgene, for instance. You know, this is, you know, one and a completely different stock here. But, you know, if you were just buying that initial dip, you know, that when the stock went from 140 to 120, that count the earnings report. Now it's down another 20 points. Well, multiple times it's bottom here, 94, 97, Ooh. 98 for like five, six days. And now it's trying to actually sow some life here. So there's no reason to jump in so early, you know, as a trade anyways. You know, I actually did buy some of my investment on the second yourself. day. And I probably shouldn't have did that. I probably should wait because they usually give you a second chance. But now you've got like a tradable bottom there. So that's what I would wait for on Priceline as well. You know, sometimes, you know, people are like, well, I'm going to miss it. 
usually the market to give you a second chance. And if it doesn't, well, I'll give you a second chance on a different stock then. But if you're just coming in and just randomly saying, this is down too much, 1740 is the absolute bottom. I know it is, and I'm buying it now. Uh, I've lost a lot of money doing trading that way. All right. Uh, boy, we're hopping around here, but look at this 10250 level here, Dennis. Go back I'm to gonna... Celgene. Okay, yeah, we'll go this... back to Priceline, promise. No, we are going second. a lot of tangents on pre-market prep. No, no, look at this. Uh, your last five highs, three of them, had been between 102.23 and 102.50. Look at this on the dailies here. So keep an eye on that. I don't know if uh, so much, you know, trying along here, there's a lot of people stuck as well. But man, oh man, if I was short above 102.50, I'd be heading for the hills. You got a big gap to fill there. So uh, keep an eye on that. Uh, for the price line, I'm just going to give one number here and it really it's 1720 and it really doesn't have much to do with the trading action. You see an odd lot, I think, went off at 1680. Someone got really, really excited. Uh, but uh, you've had a pre-market low that's actually below that. The pre-market low is at uh, 1707. But a lot of times I'll go to monthly charts when uh, you see such a historical price move on this. And I see a 1720 low, boom, right here. So 1700 to 1720, it's buy zone for me. And uh, if I was short, it would definitely be a buy zone. You also had TripAdvisor report earnings last night too, and they're not good either. Spencer details on TRIP. Yeah, TripAdvisor, uh, the, the the price line trip move uh, is the move in the morning. So thirty six cent uh, third quarter EPS that beat the estimate by a penny. Sales uh, four hundred and thirty nine million dollars was the. Uh, let me get my estimate here correct. Uh, four thirty nine was what they reported for. Fifty one million is what was the estimate. So they missed the estimate by twelve million dollars there, and that's what's hitting the stock. And it's down five bucks. And I mean, these stocks are all related. And actually, if we were taking tips from Expedia, and this is one thing, you know, that a lot of traders fail to do. I mean, look, you know, two weeks ago, we had Expedia report and it wasn't good. And they hit the stock down 20 bucks. So if you were taking that tail of the tape and applying it to Priceline, you'd have been shorting it in the earnings report and you'd be making money. Doing the same thing with Chip and you'd be making money. So there, there's, you know, there's trade is always with sympathy as well. And when one company in the sector reports disappointing earnings, it often means the other ones are going to follow suit. So that's the way I've always, you know, and that's my, my trading style is I've always been more of a Paris trader. When I see, you know, indications or I see something, you know, a stock, and even from the day trading perspective, I see one stock start popping in the sector, I automatically think about the sympathy plays. I rarely am playing the leader. I'm usually playing the laggards or the other stocks in the sector because that's where I feel like I have an edge. Because sometimes there's a little lag in, you know, the time that the response. And, you know, from an earnings reports perspective, it's always scary to short a stock in earnings. So not suggesting any trader or new trader should be doing that. Just saying there is traders that do that type of stuff. And those traders that were taking that call from Expedia just last week or a week and a half ago when they reported are making money today on Priceline and TripAdvisor. And it does not look like the pre-market sellers are done as of yet. We just made a new pre-market low at 34.17, last print 34.46. So definitely uh, still uh, taking this thing out to the woodshed. Uh, let's go your longer term charts and ooh, nothing in there. Nothing in there on the monthlies, Dennis. Uh, 2863 was your November 2012 low. I don't think you'll get there. Just half and whole numbers on this one. I mean, at 30 bucks. I mean, if you want to throw out a real big whole number, but uh, uh, TripAdvisor just in a dangerous zone here. Let's talk about some of these other stocks and the chat's all over them. And they're all the ones on my list too. All the earnings stocks, Weight Watchers, WTW. And I just want to say, we've said this multiple times, oh. even when Oprah came out and, you know, uh, came out behind Weight Watchers way back. When was that? Let's go back. Was it was a couple October, of years ago now, October wasn't it? 2015. October 2015 is when that was. We made or the November. rule <laughs> then never fade Oprah. Because we watched what Weight Watchers did, and it went from like six bucks up to twelve the next day when it was announced that Oprah was jumping on board, uh, jumping on the Weight Watchers bandwagon to help them out. Obviously, you know, get her marketing power behind it, and the stock blasted off twenty eight bucks. It did pull back in 2016, 2017, got back down to the nine ten area, but it's been a monster ever since. So 
Next stock that Oprah comes and gets her marketing power behind, I'm automatically buying it. <laughs> and here are the numbers. Q3 EPS of $0.65 cents is a $0.14 cent beat. Sales of $323 million is a $4 million beat. Subscribers up 18.4% year over year. They're also raising their fiscal year EPS wow. guidance by $0.30 cents on the low end of the range. Gone. I mean, the stock's <laughs> blasting off here again. 128,000 shares have already traded. I mean, it's a monster. Now, am I coming in here? It was $10 stock at the beginning of the year. It's 50 now. You're very late to the party here now, but just goes to show you the power of Oprah here. This company was in trouble before Oprah got it on board. Stock was $85 back in 2012, was down to five bucks. Oprah gets on board, turns the whole company around. I mean, the, the girl's just incredible. You know, from a marketing perspective, there's nobody more powerful than Oprah. Oh, my Lord. Fifty one ninety eight. Uh, that is the first time the stock has been over fifty dollars. And you need to go back to February of 2013 when you had a fifty five oh two high. Uh, nice trading range, though. You hit that fifty one ninety eight, Dennis. And buyers came in here at forty eight twenty. And that was enough for a two point bounce here. So. Look for let's look for the early trading range here 4820 to 5198. Uh, 5150 stopped at last time, so I think sellers are coming off that 5198 high. I'm sure a lot of people have 50 bucks as a target, uh, in this one. I just don't know if you're gonna have enough buyers to sustain it over 50 bucks the entire day. Jump over here, uh, just to VRX, which is That's another right. Did you stock. Want to say something on that? No, I didn't. I just wanted to say you said, Oh my lord. My oh my lord, oh Oprah, never mind. I'll, oh, I'll see myself. I'll see I myself have gone out. To Spencer I'll know. see myself out. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I heard crickets on that one. <laughs> BRX here, uh, paying down a little more debt than we thought. I think that's the main thing from the report. But Spencer, give us the numbers. Uh, three dollars and sixty nine cents. Uh, that's a loss of three dollars and sixty nine cents. I didn't make three. Cents. <laughs> right, sorry. Yes, apologies. <laughs> uh, They're good at losing money. 89 cent estimate sales of 2.22 billion versus 2.17. So that also uh, may not compare. So not they're paying down debt. That's that's the only the thing. Debt. And I think they were paying down. They, I, and I, I just saw the headline fly by, so I'm not reading it. So bear with me. But I, I think they said that the, the 5 billion debt that they want to pay down is getting paid down sooner than they thought. So if it's already paid down, I'm not sure. I didn't read the whole story. It was just a headline that went by. But VRX, I'm assuming, is up huge on that. We know, and I've talked on this show multiple times, it's the debt that scares me away from this stock. So as they continue to pay down more debt and get themselves out of trouble here, that makes the stock more attractive to an investor like me, and it makes the stock more attractive to investors that are in this market. That is why the stock is up 16% here in the pre-market, squeezing the shorts a little bit as well. I still think there's a lot of issues here at VRX, so I'm not coming here and jumping in this and throwing it in my invest portfolio. Uh, but they are getting themselves out of the scenario. I always used to say this is a zero or a hundred dollar stock, and I'm not saying that anymore because they've sold off so much stuff that the hundred is completely off the table. The stock is obviously not the case at all, but they're trying to take the zero off the table as well by getting the debt out from underneath them. So now you can't really say that anymore. Um, I. It's too hard for me, you know, just analyzing this, though, to stick this in my investment portfolio because there's just too many unknowns still in VRX. All right. Uh, we're moving. We're making new highs as we speak in the pre-market session. 1403 is your last print. Now, I looked at the, started to look at some numbers here, and I saw 1431 as a uh, October 12th high. It's right there. We're only 28 cents uh, away from that. But then I started to look a little bit farther here back on my uh, my trade station data window here. And listen to this, Dennis. Uh, if you wanted some formidable resistance uh, between September 26 and that October 12th date, all the highs were between 1430 and 1574. All of them. Every one of them. So that's one. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 12 sessions in a row. So four, they were there 12 sessions in a row at the 1450 area. If I was long, that's where I'd be looking to get out. Coming back on downside, I am terrible at buying stocks that gap up. Actually, I really don't do it. Uh, we'll wait to come back down to the top of yesterday's range. And that could be a real long wait because that was down at 1218. I mean, there's 
sometimes, you know, you miss a lot of trains, like, because you don't jump on board off the first thing. But with stocks of 16%, I don't chase them either. It's just not my style to come and buy something that's, you know, up 16%. A lot of people make money doing that. A lot of people like trading that momentum. And if you are good at that, by all means, do it. I think me and you, Joe, were so, you know, we came, you know, old old school, a lot of fading back in the day. And the fade trade is difficult trade. I mean, it's not been the market where the contrarian has really had much luck. I mean, there's been moments in time where contrarian trades have been working again. But we've been in this momentum market really for seven years and you got to adjust. And, you know, I do do a lot of momentum trades here now. I've been, you know, adjusting my trading styles as well. But uh, the contrarian blood is still in me. And when I see a stock up, you know, two bucks, I'm like, oh, I want to fade it. But it's been tough fade. It's been tough to fade uh, any moves in any sectors. You know what? It, it also just it's tough. It's tough to fade it that day at that point at that moment. Oh, for sure. OK. But on the other hand, if it you know goes up to fourteen fifty and you know trades fourteen fifty, fourteen seventy for three or four days, then you have a reference point, right? The, you know, if you're trying to short it today, you know the wounds are still fresh. You got shorts covering fourteen's a psych number. Uh, just keep an eye on that pre market high, but just be aware longer term that uh, you know where the stock could go. John Dodson, just, uh, I'm just going to read what you just said in the chat. And this is a great point. It says, always remember, traders, another train is coming. If you miss the last one, um, there's going to be another trade. There's always another trade. So that's, you know, one thing here. And I think a lot of people, a lot of, you know, newer investors and a lot of investors altogether, even seasoned ones, get themselves in trouble uh, because they start chasing price. And sometimes it works, but most of the time, from my experience, it doesn't. So when you see, you know, something you know, going up, 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 it's automatic. Oh, I want to get on board. I want to get on that. But in a lot of times when you see it and everybody else has seen it, that's just, you know, going to be the time where it's going to probably top out on you. So it's difficult to make money consistently if you're chasing price all the time. Yeah. Uh, there was another Car Carl Carey uh, tweeted this out yesterday. I'm just going to read this, too. And he's talking about Bitcoin there. And I'm um, just saying, you know, is it a bubble or not? It's still to be determined. We don't know that much about Bitcoin. But there was, this was just a saying from back in the day. So this saying didn't pertain to Bitcoin, but he was saying it might apply. And he was saying, just hang on one second. I'm, ho I'm holding. Yeah, there, I was just grabbing the tweet. There is nothing so disturbing to one's well-being and judgment as to see a friend get rich. That is just a great quote because, you know, there, I'll just read it again. There's nothing so disturbing to one's well-being and judgment as to see a friend get rich. And you know why that applies so much? Because you see your friend making money in this and he's, oh, he's up so much in Bitcoin. I've got to get in that now. And you're not thinking about, you know, logic. You're not thinking about, you know, analyzing it. You just want in because your friend is making money and I need to be in that too. And that applies not just to Bitcoin. That applies to everything. And, you know, maybe Bitcoin is the next good thing. We don't know. But I think a lot of it applies to it right now. I think there's a lot of people jumping in Bitcoin that aren't sitting there and analyzing and doing valuations and trying to figure out, you know, they're just jumping in because their friend is in and your, their friend's making money. And in the long run, if you're just jumping in everything that your friend is in and he's making money in, you're late to the party. And the guy that's late to the party often isn't the one that's going to be making the money in the long run. Ah, uh, I mean, that's a good tweet. It says something, but Jeff Goldman told me to buy this thing at 250. I never did. I, I mean, I, well, that would have been a good I, one. I'm it's happy for him. I'm, I'm like, I mean, I'm happy for him. I mean, he does remind me every time I go into his gym that, uh, you know, he, he might, but uh, I mean, that's saying, I mean, GBTC, you can see that thing finally had a breakout over 700. But uh, it's funny you mentioned Bitcoin because, uh, you know, Spencer and I and the Brentster have been talking about, man, we got to do something on Bitcoin here. We got to cover it. We got to find the ins and outs of it. Uh, I think that the Merck, you know, going to the futures contract and uh, Joe Saluzzi just uh, just tweeted this out. Will the CME tame the underlying, you know, Bitcoin exchanges? Is the liquidity going to dry up in those change and go to a regulated market? I that's a very good question. See what happens I'm, on that. I mean, we could be early in this still, and obviously this isn't traded. And when things come and start trading, that's going to continue to propel it as well. Uh, but you know, I'm out on Bitcoin. I've not been involved in Bitcoin at all. It's something that I've said on this show multiple times. Congratulations to everybody who's been in it. That's fantastic. But the reason I'm out is I, I can't I don't understand value. It. 
I can't figure out how to put a pencil and come up with a value for a Bitcoin. There was a professor that came out and said this exact same thing, and he was giving the logic behind it, saying, great trading vehicles, but how do you really value it? You know, this could be a zero, it could be a million. I don't know, because I can't figure out how to value the thing. There's no cash flows. There's not like a company can sit down and say, okay, you got cash flows here. So this is the money you're getting. You got dividends here. You got, you know, you're in a 2% environment. You got a dividend of 4%. You can say different things. You can't do that with Bitcoin. So it's very difficult to value. And that's why, you know, I'm a value guy. I've always been a value guy. I'm not going to change my style just because of Bitcoin. And I'm going to let that train just, you know, that ship sail. It's, I'm not going to be involved in that one, but I'm not going to let it bother me as a trader and say, oh my goodness, I was so dumb for not getting involved in Bitcoin. There's lots of other things to make money on here too. I'm an equities trader. I'm going to stick with equities. I tried trading currencies back 10, 15 years ago. It's the same thing, really. It's very difficult to value currencies. I mean, traditional currencies, you can look, you can look at different things that you can look at the economies of the, you know, the countries that are behind the currencies, but I have no idea how to value Bitcoin. And that's why I'm not going to be participating in it. I hope it goes. I hope, hope it keeps going up for everybody that's involved in it because, you know, that's nice that people are making money. You know, it's nice that other people make money. It keeps the economy going when things are going, you know, good. When everybody's losing money, everything gets sour out there. So that's, you know, just my point is that if you're not involved in something, don't jump in just because your friend is involved in it. Jump in because you're confident or jump in because you've done your homework. Don't just jump in something that you don't do your homework in. Uh, Dennis, up to you do your homework in here and uh, is GE. And uh, I just want to talk about that for one second before we bring Nick on. Uh, it, is there a buy imbalance? There is again. And we've been talking <laughs> about this. And this is my bread and butter is these kind of <laughs> trades. Like, you know, that I look here at, you know, imbalances and I, and I look at these morning things. And I look for trends. GE turned three days ago. The trend turned. And you can say, okay, well, I gave it all back yesterday. But I'm trading the open, the close and looking at, you know, the open here and it had a nice gap up yesterday at the open. I think it could potentially gap up here again today, already 133,000 shares uh, to trade here on it, uh, to, to buy this morning from the buy imbalance and uh, stocks trading up 12 cents here in the pre-market and say, oh, what's 12 cents when you can make you know thousand dollars in Bitcoin? Well, this is my <laughs> bread and butter. You know, I like hitting base hits. I like consistency. I like to make money four out of five days a week. So, you know, this is the kind of stocks that I trade. You know, and I also obviously invest in G as well, and that's completely separate. But <laughs> we won't you know, talk this about just, that. <laughs> we won't <laughs> talk about my long term. I should have sold G a long time ago with my investment portfolio. But there's trades here, and it turned a couple days ago. It really did. Um, from my perspective, just from the imbalances looking at, because we've had sell imbalances in G for two months. They are gone now. There hasn't been sell imbalances here. So some institution is done selling finally, and it's institutions that really drive price in the long run. We know that. You know, it's not the little guy that's moving price. You know, it's the guy that's selling a million shares or two million or 25 million shares of GE over the course of the last two months, really driving it down. Maybe we've been selling 100 million or 200 million. We've been selling a lot of stock because it's been, you know, two, three, 400,000 to sell every single day. And now there's been buy imbalances here. So it's interesting how the stock starts to turn when these imbalances start to turn as well. Square, the, the Square is still, you know, consistently buy and balance every single day. I'm still on the Square bullish train just because I see these buy and balances every morning. 90,000 shares to buy an SQ here again. Alibaba's been the same story. And this is the one we like both from a fundamental perspective too, Joel. And we've been talking, you know, bullish on it for a long time on the show. 93,000 to buy an Alibaba here again this morning as well. So the, the, the trends are persistent here in some of these stocks. And the trend is your friend. Uh, Dennis Square reports uh, after the market on the eighth, so I don't know how you know if you want to be playing that trick again. When it, I guess it's after the close, so you don't have to worry about it. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention about GE here, a couple ways, and we're not going to have time to do it here because uh, Nick is coming on. But instead of running and going with the imbalance, you could fade the imbalance, and if you had did that. Uh, in Monday session, I got it open at 2052, Dennis. I don't know if that was a New York open or some odd lot, you know, on some other meaningless exchange, but uh, 2052 open, 2053 high traded down to 2008. So another way to pay the imbalances. All right. It is G taken off again, 251,000 to buy now. It just popped another nickel just because the buy imbalances doubled. Good Friends. morning. Good morning, Nick Shaheen. He's the author of Create Income with Option Spread. Nick, we've been silent here for 35 and a half minutes because we are all waiting for your breakdown <laughs> of Priceline. First of all, did you go lotto? Okay. And second of all, 
I know you get down and dirty in these reports. Are you going to do that in Priceline today? Well, uh, I did not do a lotto just because I had um, a losing lotto the day before. So I stuck to my guns. I was like, I picked uh, a wrong one. I just don't want to pick a second wrong one. Just because, uh, you know, literally for the earnings report, it's a coin flip for the short term reaction. Uh, so um, luckily, I would have picked up. And uh, I, I'm happy I didn't pick because uh, it's a 50-50 shot just on the headline itself. Now, seeing it down 9%, that's a pretty big move. So uh, I, I will have to see how it uh, behaves. And if markets weren't at all-time highs, I'd be selling puts almost blindly at the open because the premiums would be so crazy. And it'll be something way down below this current price, way out in time. So I'd have time to manage it should anything happen uh, there forward. So this is a violent one. I mean, I've seen it move 100 bucks for no reason. So down 9% or whatever it was last time I checked, that's pretty serious stuff. Um, it did lose a trend line. Uh, so it might have uh, a measured move that it wants to satisfy first. But uh, we'll see how the rhetoric goes around it. And uh, we'll go from there. All right, uh, waiting for the trading action and price line. Nick, do you go different time frames? I mean, here I am. I got a daily up with a 1774 high. I usually talk about, you know, different moves, different time frames. I mean, will this we uh, we try and hone in on a weekly or a monthly? What time frame are you used to analyze this stock? I, I do definitely look at different time frames. First, I start with a daily, and this just gives me an idea of where things stand, but I definitely zoom out uh, to see if there are any weekly trends. And if I'm trying to take a, a position, I would want to see confirmation from um, several timelines. So if the weekly agrees with my daily idea, that's great. If the monthly also agrees with it, that's fantastic. And I can uh, I can show you um, a snapshot in a second here. So um, it, I. If you're taking a position, if I'm taking a position in a, a serious size position, I would want to definitely consult several timelines because what you see in one frame may not be so obvious in another. So here is price line okay. on several time frames on one of my windows. All right. Let me uh, pull it up here. You only did one chart in price line, right? Uh, I just threw another one. So okay. Oh, let me go to the second one. Uh, yeah. The second one has multiple time frames. There's a box on the upper right hand corner, which is uh, the daily. Uh, they're labeled at the top end, of, uh, and the one on the left top is a monthly, and then I mean a weekly. Um, and the one on the bottom, the bigger one, is a monthly. So it kind of gives you perspective as to what trend lines are there. And the monthly shows that that trend line could be extended a lot further in time, which means that the drop could be down to like 1600 or less, just based on a measured move. It all depends on the market-wide price action as well, because it seems like um, markets are not well. Traders are not willing to sell anything and not uh, and just sit. They sell something to buy something, and, and I guess we're calling it rotation because uh, nobody wants to sell everything. They want to be involved in this market because they see no demise to it. All right, coming out of the chat, Nick, how would you play Baba? So I'll put it put. Credit spread, strikes, month. I mean, it's getting up here pretty lofty. What's your approach for Alibaba? Well, if somebody is saying that Alibaba is pretty lofty, uh, then they shouldn't be saying I want to sell puts in it. Uh, so That was it, me that said that. That was oh, not Spice. Okay, okay. That was not Spice. <laughs> Okay, so Baba is uh, definitely having a good trend uh, for a year. If you look on the daily, it's uh, up, up and away. Um, it is having trouble with this zone right here, 190, and between 185 and 190. But it, it could be trying to set it as a bottom uh, to go forward, so as a platform from which it can spring forward. So um, the idea to short just because it's so high doesn't work all the time, especially in, in Momo stocks. Uh, so I wouldn't short it just for that reason. I would want to find a, a fundamental reason to short it, like metrics are wacky or uh, you know whatever they promised us is not likely going to happen. Um, the trend is, is definitely against you if you want to short it. However, if I do want to short it, I will buy a debit put spread. And I usually like to be closer to the money um, and out in time because it's going to cost me the same amount of money whether I short it for this week, next week, or a month from now. Uh, usually when you buy a spread, 
calls or puts, it doesn't matter, near the money, you're going to spend about half the width of that spread. What about a put? Spice is asking about a put credit spread up here. Is it just too lofty, too much of a run here? No, it's it's not. If you look, there is a level at 170 that looks solid, uh, bounced for two, three times already, which was the level from which it broke out last time. So it depends on what time frame you want to short them. Uh, and there's no earnings coming. I think they already reported. Right. So credit put spread is okay for me a month out um, it's, or if somebody active, they want to sell it closer to the money uh, more often, that's fine. But they have to know what they're doing. When you sell a credit put spread, you collect the amount of money and that's the most you can make. And the, the balance between that and the spread width is the risk you have and that's the most you can lose. So if you're okay at losing that, the yield is pretty high usually. Uh, for a short period of time you know it sounds like oh i'm risking four dollars to make a dollar for example on a five dollar wide spread but really you're making more than 25 percent in about two weeks or three weeks that's pretty fantastic yield all right let's talk about the crude oil market and i know that you've been trading the range in that for a long time and then a few mm -hmm. days ago it came up to the top of the range and you're like i, I don't know i just might lay off at this time and lo and behold you finally got that breakout over 55 dollars um, I want to ask you, I know you like to keep an eye on the fundamentals and uh, what uh, went on in Saudi Arabia over the weekend. Uh, I'd kind of like to hear your fundamental analysis that and you think it's uh, uh, impacted the price of oil as well as its uh, future direction. Sure. First of all, let's talk technicals. Crude, this breakout has been promised from 2018. I'm going to say July, uh, 2016, July. Um, and finally, we got to it. Um, I don't know. You remember I, I sent out a lot of notes. Okay, we're going, we could go to 5860 based on a technical move. And this is the, the fruition of it. Now, fundamentally, this unease in crude is warranted. Um, fundamentally, I don't think crude should be up here. But with the new leader, the crown prince, um, and what he's doing, that seriously destabilizes the region politically. I mean, I, I'm Lebanese and the prime minister in Lebanon resigned because of what happened in Saudi Arabia. And he was basically told to resign, I think, or something like that. So it's a mess. Messes create unease and they are a huge producer of oil, obviously, them alone, let alone the region, tensions between them and Iran. So uh, uncertainty, you talk about changing Fed heads here. Just imagine changing leadership in that whole area. Saudi Arabia is the head of OPEC, basically, effectively. So just imagine that they control about, what, 35% of the world's oil. Uh, so the production, it's, it's, a serious, it's a serious matter. I would not short uh, crude. I'll give you an idea. I was short the, uh, the, the XOP which is crude related, but it was part of an iron condor. The profit, the, the trade is still profitable. I defended it yesterday by buying calls just in case they want to spike it. Then I'll be profitable even if it rallies past my credit call spread. And the, what side of the fence are you on over there? I mean, uh, you know, sweeping reforms. Do you have an mm -hmm. opinion or do you not want yeah. to share it? I do have an opinion. Uh, you know, he seemed wanting to do reform and he seemed wanting to modernize the region. And then he pulls a dictator, something that a dictator would do. So I, okay. I don't I don't know his intentions. Um, you know, I mean, even uh, what, what's his name? Prince uh, Ben Awalid, uh, whatever his name is, who is seem modern, uh, owns Twitter. He's uh, frequently on CNBC and is a heavy investor in Citigroup, I think. Um, and he, he's part of the people that got arrested. I don't know any of the other people. So I didn't read into the heads that got um, rolled either. So I, I don't know why he's doing it or what his intentions are, but I just can't imagine his opposition is going to lay down. It, it's been there forever. Nick, do you trade uh, the VIX at all? Spice wants to know, would you sell a call spread? Or she's asking, uh, actually, actually, Brad D that. But uh, Brad D is asking, Nick, do you ever trade VIX options, such a call spread at this low level? No, I do not. Uh, and the VIX is kind of broken. Yesterday, VIX was green most of the day. Uh, VIX futures were terribly red, yet the VIX was green. So something uh, is above my pay grade that, that goes to the VIX. I've tried to play it before, but you know, it, the only way you can play it is if you buy calls when it's really, really low and just hope for a bounce and then get out of it. But even then, the prices you see in the premiums, the prices you see in the options are not what you're going to get when you try to trade it. At least for me, the experience have been, oh, great, they're in the money. Now I can profit. And then you go to sell it and there are no buyers. So 
you know, yes, I've seen the VIX up to 90, but it's going to take a flash crash for that to happen. And if you're lucky enough holding calls, then then you really are profiting. Uh, until then, I don't know if I can, I haven't played it. It's just a frustrating event for me. All right, Nick, let's jump over into a couple other stocks here. And we've went through most of earnings season. We're coming into the retailers now at the end of the earnings season here. But just to recap here, you know, we've had an interesting earnings season. Some stocks have been beating and going higher. Some stocks have been beating and going lower. It's been a tough market to really interpret the earnings. And, you know, like, you know, and we've had examples of, you know, that we've given on the show multiple times, you know, but like Microsoft beaten pops. And then you get, you know, other stocks that beat and drop. How do you play stocks like, you know, in the earnings, you know, going into them, first of all? And how do you like interpret, you know, what we just came through where some stocks, you know, like Fang really did well, you know, popping up to highs. And then other stocks were getting hit. Well, it all depends on the stock. Uh, you know, what you just said proves what I started with uh, as far as asking uh, about price line. The, the, the short term reaction to the headline itself is pure gambling. Regardless of how good the quality, or regardless of the quality of the report, uh, we saw GE deliver a terrible report, and it went from minus six percent to plus two percent by the end of the day. So it makes no sense how they react to the stock. And then uh, you know somebody delivers a, a a bad report, they actually fall like they should, and then somebody delivers a good report, they actually fall like they shouldn't. So it's complete gambling. You can skew your you know your by by looking into open interest and and all of that your odds, but really the it's a binary event. So you play it the way you want to play it long term. For example, I went long Apple and I I sold puts or credit put spreads to buy calls and I was lucky enough to profit that way. But if I had missed it, guessed wrong, I would not have gotten hurt because I would have owned Apple at a much lower price than now, which would still be okay because long term that's the play to do. So pick your stock if you know it. Trade it along the lines of fundamental side and uh, bet on the direction it wants to go. So do you use this as opportunities sometimes? Like, for instance, if a stock gets hit really hard on a report and, you know, you like that company, is that something that you jump in and then start writing puts against it? Or yes. do you actually? Okay. Yes, that's how you should do it. The best bets on earnings are set after the trade. Like if you have been tracking Priceline and you love it, I bet you you can collect a bag full of premium this morning at the open we're selling a put down in the 1200s probably for the next six months or something like that i'm just purely guessing now <laughs> just look at the premiums uh, it was slated to move about 120 points i think 110 points just based on the options pricing from yesterday uh, so it'll probably exceed that this morning um, but if you really like Priceline fundamentally and you think that this malaise is just because of hurricanes or whatever, then I would go out in time and look way below now. Uh, give yourself a 30% buffer if you want because markets are at all-time highs and sell a put or a put spread. You can collect, if a put spread, you can probably collect 10% on yield or taking a risk on Priceline for falling another 20, 30% or own it and collect a bag full of premium. Nick, what about GE? You mentioned that here. I know that that price action off the report, I think that contributed a lot to the sell-off because you had the bad report, but then it rallied back and closed near the high of the session and a couple downgrades here. How are you analyzing this stock? Dennis and I have been looking at it from a uh, market, uh, from a balanced perspective and all during this run. I mean, for weeks, Dennis was talking about quarter of a million to sell, half a million to sell, 300,000 to sell. And it bared out pretty well. Now you're getting near 20 bucks, getting very close to the flash crash low of 2015 here. Can you find it? Probably not a lot of premium in these long-term options, but uh, is it time to stick your toe in the water in GE? Boy, uh, this is going to put your question from earlier about multiple time frames too. Here's the multiple time frame we're looking on GE. So the, I'm not an expert on the company itself, but it seems like a dinosaur just from how long it's been. Um, and this is going back, if you look at the monthly or the bottom one, back to 1997 levels. Uh, so this level of big contention for a decade at least. I haven't gone further than that. I could. Um, so, so I'm not qualified to tell you the future of GE but I can tell you that I'm not selling puts in it just because A, there's not enough premium for that. And B, I have no visibility as to what they're going to do. 
Um, but it is a massive company and it has a lot of fans, I guess. And this is a pivotal level and it's not a given that it will hold. All right. Anything else uh, on your radar that you would uh, like to talk about? I know that uh, in your chat, uh, people have been asking a lot about Bitcoin here and it seems to be the uh, flavor of the month. Uh, GBTC, I guess, is the way to track it through the exchange. Uh, any thoughts on Bitcoin? Well, I have issue with saying GBTC is the way to track it. Yeah. Um, because if it were, GBTC was around 700 when Bitcoin was at all-time high. So obviously, there are other things playing in GBTC, which, which by the way, the high was like 1,100 almost on GBTC. So it, it is it, it does move with Bitcoin, but it might have also some hair. Remember, what's his name? Citron guy shorted it or was in the headline saying it was a uh, irresponsible long or something like that. Anyway, so there are plenty of little penny stocks in there. So... Bitcoin is plug your nose and buy it if you want it, because uh, I have a, a few friends in the chat room that actually bought it. And um, one of them bought it around twenty five hundred. and He thought he was throwing his money away. So obviously he tripled his money, his money and uh, it could all disappear tomorrow. I don't know about that. There are too many people that want this and I'm going to call it an asset. It's not a f currency to me. It's something this violent that moves this fast. It could not be a currency. It's like gold. It's, it's rare. People love it. And it's going to go up, period. That's my opinion. So if you want to, there are plenty of penny stocks. Like, um, you know, I've been educating myself from, from the people in the chat room. P-R-E-L-F -E -E is one of them. There's a bunch of ones that sound like B-C-K-L-F or whatever. You just look into them. There's tons of them. Uh, do your homework and see if they're legit companies and see if they're listed here versus abroad and see if you can want to uh, participate for pennies or a couple of bucks or three dollar stocks or something like that. You know, yesterday I dipped my toe in one of them and I jumped in and out uh, because I saw a breakout coming. And it didn't happen. So I lost a hundred bucks on it, but not a big deal. So, yeah, it's a it's a gamble, just like gold was a gamble when it first was discovered, I'm sure. All right. We've been on the line with Nick Shaheen. He is the author of Create Income with Option Spreads. Nick, great input. Everybody enjoys it. Me, Dennis, and the chat. We'll talk to you again next Tuesday. Can't wait. Thank you. S&P futures are coming off the low of the session, 86.75. Uh, now in the green, Dennis, did those buying balances maybe contribute to that little bump in the S&P futures? Same ones, getting bigger. GE, 258000 to buy. BABA, 128000 to buy. SQ, 168000 to buy. So those ones keep growing. There's some other ones here, too, that are interesting. Pfizer, 41000 to sell. Bristol Myers doesn't show up on the imbalance filter that often. BMY is 51000 to sell here this morning, so that is of significance as well for that stock. Disney, 70000 to buy. We know Disney's been all through the news here as of late. Had a big day yesterday. as rumored that they might be buying parts of Fox. There's also a rumor which materialized yesterday on Betaville that uh, Twitter might be, uh, in, or Disney might be interested in talking again. with Twitter there again. One thing about Betaville, and you know, I don't know these people. I don't know anything about it, but there's a lot of alerts over there all the time, and I don't what? know any of them. I don't know if any of them have ever materialized into being factual. So when I hear something from Betaville, I automatically think fade. And last night, Twitter, TWTR, was 1939 close. It went up to 1999 on that rumor. So I did short some stock. I didn't get 1999. I was a little bit early. I was getting it in the 70s and 80s, but um, it's looking pretty good fade here now. Uh, I don't know where, you know, the, the, where they're getting the information from or where they're getting, you know, these rumors from or not, but I just, from my experience, I haven't seen, I don't know if any of those have ever materialized and actually working out and coming true. Spencer, do you know? I, I don't know, but I, when, when did we do this dance the first time? We talked about Betaville like a year ago it, on the show. It, it was, it and was, there's lots of place, people that publish rumors. And you're allowed to publish whatever right. you want. Of course. But, you know, at a certain point in time, you've got to, ha you know, you got to hit one. So, uh, or otherwise, it's just rumors, and, you know, you're going to get called it. out. And I, I think Betaville used to pop stocks even a lot more than, you know, sometimes they do now, because yep. I think a lot of people realize that these rumors don't materialize that often. Okay, look at uh, Twitter on October 25th of last year, because that was the day that, that it popped on, and I just found this on the Pro by searching for Betaville, uh, okay. that, that um, did, they reported that, that Disney could buy Twitter on October 25th. 2016. So that's the day that Twitter really popped off that news. And that was like their, their, their big day. And I, and I said, I remember saying this at the time, you only get like one shot 
right? I, like in terms of credibility. And if you miss it, you, you're done. And so I don't think they move stocks nearly as much as, as that one day because that was their shot and they missed it. Although they moved this last night, Twitter going all the way up to 1999, I was pretty much in shock at seeing that it could move up that much. It's these rare alerts, and I'm not sure if I have it. They call it rare alerts, and the rare stands for something. Let me just go and see. You know, we're giving some beta bill a little bit of press here, too. Like, I mean, it, it credits to them to be able to move stocks, but I'm just trying to see what that stands for. It's a uh, rare it, alert. It basically, Find- it basically just means it's an unverified uh, rumor. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's akin to chat room chatter. Do they no. ever come out with their stuff during the middle of the day where there's liquidity? I, 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 I don't know when not. it's. I don't, I don't know when they come out with it. But they're in. You know, they're in uh, uh, UK. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so it's. Opposite. Is that where this is? This is in the UK. Bradyville is owned by Financial Times. Oh, it is. This is a Financial Times thing. Oh, I didn't even realize that. The Financial Times is it? Is I, 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 I believe so. I, like I, I, I believe so. It, is. That's uh, it does look yes. like when I look yeah, at the page, it's, it does it's, look it's like fun. a financial. Oh, I'm sorry. Times. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's correct. It's, I don't know if they're owned by it or not, but it does. The page looks similar to Financial Times, so it could be. So I can't find oh. where they, they defined it. One, you know, what's the definition of the rare alert? And I, I laughed when I read that. The could definition. be Alphaville. Sorry, I, I may be confusing Alphaville and Betaville. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, I'm I, just trying I, to see I think, what... I think I'm confusing Alphaville and Betaville, so I do apologize. Not owned by FT, but still in the UK. Uh, okay, the the rare alert, the definition is this is market gossip that hasn't been tested through all formal journalistic channels. Um, public That means public relations, executives, bankers. The rumor might be totally codswallop. I don't even know what that word means. But Fake. then again, there might so be something to definitely it. So it's British. worth sharing on Betaville. So basically, they might say it just might be nothing to this, but there might be something to it. So somebody's heard something through you know, the thing. But you pop and stocks 5 6% because somebody <laughs> might have heard something. That's just going, you know, nothing against Betaville there. That's going against the market just being silly. And, you know, that's what, you know, as traders, we have to be able to profit from silly opportunities. And if you were selling Twitter last night at 1985, 1990, 1999, when it got up to kiss $20 last night on this, you know, rumor that, you know, somebody might have heard something, you're making money today. So I'm a fader, um, you know, when I see these ridiculous moves off of rumors. Do we have any uh, worthwhile ratings to discuss this morning? I know we Covered a few. lot. What do you like? Las Vegas Sands upgraded Morgan Stanley to overweight. That stock's trading up a buck in the pre-market. Ooh. LVS. Uh, sixty-seven fifty-five. That's your last print. I've seen a lot of volume. What I'd like to do here is go to the daily charge. Ooh, high of the move, sixty-seven thirty-eight. So keep an eye on that. Let's just call it split it sixty-seven forty-five, sixty-seven fifty. Gets above that, then you're in breakout here in Las Vegas Sands. Also, Under Armour. So we got uh, some ratings just from the retailers here. And UAA, let's take a look at this one for a second because it has just been absolutely destroyed. We know Under Armour just can't catch a bid. While it's getting an upgrade here this morning from Susquehanna and it's catching a small bid, it's up 1.5% here. Nice candle yesterday. And if you're looking at you know the UAA chart, I do like the fact it had three lows in the same area and got out of that area. So I actually like this upgrade, you know, and I like my two-day move. So that's, you know, getting a little bit of follow through here. Now, if I was going long, this position if it makes new lows i absolutely do not want to be part of this but there could be a tradable bounce here in under armor uh 1220 your three-day high opens up to 1295 after that so uh keep an eye on it uh trading right now up 18 cents high of the pre-market session uh Dennis, any final imbalance comments or uh, any other other trades? Just overall thoughts here today. These days are tricky. When you get a day that we're up seven cents on the spy or up a point or down a point, it's always hard to get a theme. And the way I approach every single trading day is I want to identify what's the driver for today. What is really moving prices around in the overall market? And I don't really see a driver here today. You know, I see financials kind of just mixed here this morning. The TLT is basically flat. It's up seven cents. So it's a non driver driver. The USO, after having a great day yesterday, is just sitting there flat. So it's a non-driver. So you're scrambling. And, you know, really from the earnings reports, okay, yeah, we had price line, but we have any like real Dow components reporting, you know, something to drive it. So it's a tricky day, first of all, to figure out the driver. So I'm probably playing the themes that I've been playing for a while. Um, and that's just, you know, looking, you know, at these different opportunities and some of these, you know, 
trendy stocks that have had these imbalances, like a Square, for instance. I'm long Square again, SQ here this morning, simply because it's got a huge buy imbalance, and I'm long it because I was anticipating the buy imbalance because it's been there for a while. GE, it's turned a couple days ago, which we said, and it's got the 260,000 shares to buy. One thing, though, which we didn't mention is, and you know, when I trade these imbalances, it's not always a matter just to go with it. You know, the traditional strategy is when you see a huge buy imbalance and it's, you know, out of the ordinary and it's on no news. The traditional strategy, as was taught by Don Bright, who was a great trader, you know, Don passed a few years ago, but, you know, we learned so much from Don back in the day. He was a fader of the big imbalances. And if you were fading, you know, GE yesterday when I had that million share buy imbalance, which I tweeted out multiple times, it opened right at the high at 2053 and came in. So it was interesting at 2015. It was interesting at 20, interesting at 2025. It just got over were done and it kept going up 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 and then obviously you know at that point in time it was when the trade was the other way all right 901 spencer a minute over here people are really getting uh their money's worth what do you got yeah, they're, they're banging the door down uh today uh looking ahead to tomorrow's show we're going to be joined by morad askar otherwise known as futures trader 71 is his uh, website futures trader 71.com uh Guess what he is? He's a futures trader. So he'll be on the show tomorrow at 8.35. Uh, as far as today's show, you can catch it again uh, on YouTube.com slash Benzinga TV or go to our podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Stitcher. Don't forget to like Pre-Market Prep on Facebook as well. Uh, but that's it for us today. Hope you've all had a good morning so far. And I hope you have a good rest of the day. And we'll see you folks on Wednesday.